Perfect. Excellent. Okay, okay. so uh... let me introduce you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, hi everyone. It's my great pleasure to host uh, George Delianides, my colleague from Oxford University. And let me briefly uh, talk about his um, like biography. After obtaining his PhD from the School of Mathematical Sciences of the University of Nottingham under the supervision of Sergei Utev and Huling Lee, George moved to the Department of Mathematics of the University of Leicester as a teaching fellow. And in 2012, uh, he moved to the Department of Statistics in, of the University of Oxford as a departmental lecturer. And then he stayed in Oxford until September 2016, when he moved to the Department of Mathematics of King's College London as a lecturer in statistics. And then finally, he moved back to Oxford in December 2017 as Associate Professor of Statistics, where I met George while I was doing a visit there a couple of years ago. And then today he is going to talk about uniform quantitative stability of Syncorn algorithm. The floor is yours. Many thanks for the intro, uh, Mood, and for inviting me. Uh, thanks everyone for um, for showing up. Okay, so um, as Mood said, I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, quantitative stability of the Syncorn algorithm, and in particular, uh, I'm going to give a result that is uniform um, for all the iterates of Syncorn. Um, this is joint work with Valentin de Bortoli and Arnaud Doucet. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, I'll give you a little bit, a very brief introduction to optimal uh, transport. Um, and apologies if um, this is known to everyone. So um, a basic object I will be talking about is a coupling. So a coupling of two probability measures, mu and nu, potentially on different spaces, x and y, is just a joint distribution that admits mu and nu as its marginals. And then the basic problem of optimal transport is to find the coupling that minimizes the expected um, cost with respect to some cost function C. Um, so um, in particular, this formulation is um, slightly more recent than the original version by Monge. This was by Kantorovich. The original formulation by Monge asks for, rather than um, general couplings, it asks for uh, mappings. Um, however, um, the Kantorovich formulation was much more amenable to analysis because it results in, in a convex problem. Um, now, uh, Monge's problem was actually solved, at least uh, in, in, in some cases, by Brenier um, in 1987 for quadratic costs and for uh, at least when mu has, um, is smooth enough, is uh, let's say a continuous measure then essentially there is an optimal mapping an optimal mapping that is the gradient of um, uh, the gradient of some function um, and that actually pr uh, provides the optimal coupling for the Kantorovich formulation as well however when mu is uh, discrete uh, pi is essentially a proper coupling and uh, for example when we're dealing with um, uh, in in practice we usually never have um, access to the true measure, we usually have access to some empirical version. And then when we've got uh, measures with n atoms, then um, the computational cost for um, solving this optimal transport problem is uh, around n to the 5 over 2. Um, for some cases, it can be n cubed in other cases. But in any case, um, the idea here is that by essentially introducing um, some regularization using entropy, um, the computational cost can be improved. Um, now, this was essentially realized by um, uh, Marco Couturi um, almost 10 years ago. So the entropy regularized problem is essentially, again, we're looking at the expectation of the cost, but then we add the regularizer, which is, um, the, let's say, the kullback leibler of the coupling from the joint, the uh, independent coupling of the marginals, mu and nu. Um, and then we've got an epsilon that uh, controls the uh, strength of the regularization. Now, the, um, essentially, the reason this uh, became very popular and um, um, has uh, pretty much led to an explosion of um, computational applications of optimal transport is because this is amenable to Syncorn, a Syncorn's algorithm, also known as the iterative proportional fitting procedure. And the cost there, ignoring the dimension, the, the, the dimensionality, is roughly n squared. Um, so for big problems, it can be more efficient to solve this than solving the, um, the original problem. 
Um, and it's actually the entropy regularized problem is actually equivalent to the so-called static uh, Schrodinger bridge problem, where essentially one looks for the optimal uh, projection in the sense of KL of a joint measure where um, the marginals are, are connected with some, um, some density where essentially the cost acts as a potential and uh, so this is it's called the static Schrodinger bridge problem because it, it's a sub problem of the original dynamic Schrodinger bridge where essentially the problem decomposes into um, the, the bridges of let's say Brownian motion or whatever stochastic process you're using and then the static Schrodinger bridge problem so the solution to this is known to always take this particular form you can see here so in particular what's interesting is that um, there's two potentials let's call them phi epsilon and psi epsilon and these are functions separately of x and y um, <clears throat> and uh, this is a, a very useful uh, feature for the solution to this problem uh, in particular many ways of solving um, this problem proceed by computing phi epsilon and psi epsilon which one can think of as being the dual formulation to the um, uh, to the entropy regularized uh, problem. Um, so originally, then um, the idea was to use the Schrödinger bridge problem or entropy regularized optimal transport as a computationally feasible uh, approximation to the original problem. So rather than solving the unregularized problem, we solve the regularized one for small epsilon, and we hope that the approximation is close enough. Um, and uh, actually a lot of um, early theoretical work was focused on proving essentially the convergence of the solution to the entropy regularized problem to that of the original problem and obtaining rates at which, at which this happens so on and so forth. Um, now more recent applications of Schrodinger bridges um, focus more on some of some of the intrinsic properties of the Schrodinger bridge and they uh, use it for its own benefits rather than as an approximation to the original optimal transport problem. Um, for example, one may want to build an actual coupling, um, one may want to sample for something like that, and this is how I actually got interested uh, in this problem. Um, so. The original motivation was um, to essentially construct a, uh, a differentiable particle filter that can be used as a subroutine in a machine learning algorithm so that you can back propagate through it. Uh, the problem with this is that typically with um, particle filters, uh, one uh, propagates a bunch of particles using some, um, uh, some uh, Markov kernel, which may depend on some parameters, and then constructs um, weights, importance weights, which again depend on the parameter theta, and uh, the particles are then resampled according to these weights. The problem is the resampling step introduces some indicator functions, and it's impossible to differentiate through these. So there are approximate ways to bypass this, but essentially in a recent paper with Adrian Kornflo, James Thornton, and Arnaud Dusset, we uh, we use the Schrodinger bridge to propose a different solution to, um, to this issue. Essentially, the way we dealt with it was rather than um, resampling, we built a, um, we solved the um, Schrodinger bridge between um, the uniformly weight particles and the uh, particles weighed according to the importance weights. And then this matrix, um, what's crucial about this coupling is that as soon as epsilon is positive, so we do have some regularization, this is going to be differentiable with respect to the parameter. This is in sharp contrast with the unregularized problem where typically the, um, um, the, um, the coupling matrix will focus on um, corners of the simplex and therefore will jump from corner to corner and will not be differentiable with respect to theta. Um, this, however, will give you proper coupling, so you'll be in the interior of the simplex, and therefore you can differentiate with respect to theta. There is a bias, so it's not exact, it's approximate, but we can check essentially that the bias is of the right order, so one into uh, one over the number of particles. And now this is how we got into this uh, question of stability, because in the proof of consistency, it would be very useful to be able to compare the solution of the Schrodinger bridge with empirical approximations of the marginals and compare that with the Schrodinger bridge with respect to the true measures. We didn't have access to anything like that at the time, so we um, essentially went around the problem by comparing everything to the solution of the unregularized problem for which 
um, stability results did exist. However, this doesn't allow you to keep the regularization strength um, positive and fixed and positive as n goes to infinity. So you have to kill the regularization. Um, okay, so essentially then the question is, suppose we've got two sequences of marginal probability measures converging to some limiting distributions, and we want to know when the solution of the um, either entropy or, not, or unregularized um, problem converges to the corresponding problem with the limiting marginals. So if the couplings are given by mappings, then we can also talk about whether the mappings, let's say the, Bre the Brenier optimal maps converge in some sense. Now, in, in the unregularized um, uh, problem, there is a classical qualitative solution. You can find this in Villani's book. Essentially, the answer is yes. If the marginals converge, let's say, weakly, then um, the solution to the optimal transport problem will also converge. So um, the proof goes proceeds by uh, compactness. So it's, um, it's, it's qualitative. It doesn't give any quantitative results. And it's also based on essentially um, a property of optimal maps called cyclical monotonicity that allows you to essentially identify the limiting um, points in this compact set of couplings. So uh, once we move to entropy regularized um, uh, problems, then um, compactness becomes much harder to, to make use of. Um, cyclical monotonicity isn't there, but however, for the unregularized problem, there were some quantitative results. So these are actually also very recent. They're, they appeared in the past um, two, three years. So the first one is by, actually I'm telling them in reverse chronological order, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, um, there's a result by Leon Orketo, uh, where essentially we've got two approximations to um, the marginals of interest. We're supposing that the optimal transport map is given by some um, uh, some Lipschitz uh, gradient of a convex function. And then essentially what the result is telling you is that if we look at any coupling between the, approx the approximations of the measures, then that will be concentrating around the optimal map for the limiting measures. And essentially the rate at which this is happening is um, roughly um, the uh, square root of the, the Wasserstein two distance of the approximations from the two measures. Um, another result by Marigot de Lelan Chazal, essentially there they study the map that sends um, a measure to its um, um, transport map, to its optimal transport map, and essentially they proved that if we vary one of the marginals, then the maps are essentially holder continuous uh, in, in Wasserstein uh, distance. Uh, they also proved that it cannot be improved, um, we cannot improve this to make it Lipschitz, so it's at best a uh, holder half. Uh, now, okay, so what about regularized optimal transport? Again, until very recently, um, not much was actually known. So um, a notion of cyclical monotonicity for uh, regularized problems appeared um, about, uh, well, a year and a half, two years ago in a paper by Gozal, Nats, and Burnton, and they proved a qualitative version of stability for Schrodinger bridges. Uh, now, when the state space is compact, there was another paper that actually had the quantitative statement uh, by Luisa and co-authors. This was on uh, essentially the difference in the potentials. These are the, um, the parts that appear in the exponent of the density of the solution to the problem. And essentially, they but it was uh, they proved that it's Lipschitz with respect to total variation. And when you're interested in using uh, empirical measures, total variation is too uh, strong to capture convergence. So they also had some results related to um, um, sample complexity, uh, where they leveraged um, um, essentially smoothness of the of the cost of the cost function, and they proved that the. <clears throat> Um, that at least if you're interested in the potentials, then um, the cost, the sample complexity is roughly um, uh, n to the minus a half. So it doesn't scale the dimension. Now, um, if um, if you're interested in just the cost, so just like we solve the, um, the the regularized transport problem to approximate the unregularized one, one can solve the regularized problem to approximate the cost of the unregularized version, 
And for this, what's known is that if there, if there is no regularization, then the rate of convergence suffers from the curse of dimensionality. Uh, for some miraculous reason, as soon as you introduce um, any, any um, regularization at all, uh, the, the, this does no, this no longer suffers from the curse of dimensionality. Again, these are results appearing in the past uh, three years, four years, something like that. These are very recent. Okay, so what about stability um, or quantitative stability for regularized optimal transport? So first of all, if we're interested in the full coupling, then if we measure the distance in some uniform metric like Wasserstein, so we're measuring it uniformly over a large class of functions, then there's no way around the curse of dimensionality because any coupling between uh, two measures and two approximations of those two measures, um, if we look at the Wasserstein distance, is going to be lower bounded by the distance in the first marginals or the second marginals. You pick whichever one you like, and we know that uh, is of order n to the minus 1 over d in general. So if the measures are concentrating on submanifolds and things like that, then there's better results. But in general, uh, we pay the price of dimension here. Uh, now, if one um, doesn't use uniform metrics, so for example, if you're interested in measuring convergence of the expectation of a single function, let's say, then one can get better rates, and in particular, one can get away with um, uh, a, a rate that doesn't depend uh, on the dimension, uh, like n to the minus a half. And this was again in a recent paper by uh, Rigol and Strom. So also, this, for example, gives you um, similar rates for the barycentric um, approximation, or where essentially you're looking when you go, you take the coupling, and then you're looking at the conditional expectation of the second marginal given the fed, the, the first one. So, if you like, that would be the um, the equivalent of uh, the optimal transport map, but when the um, the coupling is not given by a map, but is given by a proper coupling. So, you're looking at the conditional expectation of the second um, coordinate given the first. Okay, so um, before I give you the main um, uh, the main result, um, I want to um, essentially introduce the the algorithm. So this is called Syncorn or iterative proportional fitting. So the idea behind it is uh, the following. So we've got the marginals new and new. We've got the strength of the regularization, and we initialize um, essentially the algorithm at pi zero, which is essentially the uh, independent coupling times e to the negative of the cost. And then essentially what the algorithm does is it alternates between fixing, um, the, uh, um, fixing the first marginal and then fixing the second marginal. So what I mean by that is in odd steps, essentially we multiply the, um, the measure by um, the, the, the Radon Nicodem derivative needed to ensure that the first marginal is correct. And in even steps, we essentially uh, make sure that the second marginal is the correct one. So um, you can also formulate this as solving um, essentially KL projections. So um, smaller versions of the Schrodinger bridge problem, where in odd steps, you are um, fixing just the second marginal. And in even steps, you're fixing just the first marginal. Um, and so there is also a dual formulation in terms of uh, the potentials. So you can see here um, what that formulation is. Now, we'll see a little bit more about this um, in, uh, in later slides, but um, essentially there is a log, there is an integral, and there, there, is, an ex um, there is an exponential. And the... Um, what's inside the exponential if you like so if there's no log and no exponential um, this is pretty much a sub markov operator so it's a linear operator one can study it in uh, in many traditional uh, ways um, it's the log and the x that essentially introduces a nonlinearity that makes um, life much harder except in some very special cases now another feature about the dual formulation is that these potentials they're only defined up to a up to an additive constant so if you like because we're multiplying the measure by a product of two functions we can multiply one the, the first function by any constant and divide the second one by the same constant and the measure won't change so um, 
one way to fix this um, is to uh, make a choice and center one of the marginals on one of the potentials. So let's say you want to always choose a version of the potential corresponding to the first marginal that has expectation zero. And this was introduced by um, Guillaume Carlier. And it's, it's, it's quite useful because it allows you to fix um, a particular choice. Um, and I'll explain later um, when this is not really needed. Also, in a recent paper by Marcel Nutz and uh, Stefan Eckstein, they argue that, in fact, the centering isn't really important because this expectation is vanishing in the limit anyways. But at least it, it's, um, it's very convenient uh, to use that. Okay, so um, this is um, the first. Uh, this is our first main result. So we're working only in compact uh, uh, metric spaces. So um, the compactness is very important, and I'll explain uh, later um, what's important about it. Um, so let's say that we've got uh, two measures on some space x, pi zero and pi hat zero. We're thinking that one is an approximation of the other. And then pi 1 and approximation pi hat 1 on some other space uh, y. And then we define the synchron iterate um, corresponding to pi 0, pi 1, and pi hat 0 and pi hat 1 as p n and p hat n. Um, and then essentially our result says that for all iterations, so uniformly in the iterations of synchron, um, there is a terrible constant which we uh, label by C, that, but uh, is, is written explicitly further down, um, such that essentially up to that constant, the um, Wasserstein distance between the iterates with uh, pi 0 and pi 1 as its marginals and pi hat 0 and pi hat 1, uh, essentially they're controlled, they're Lipschitz in the Wasserstein metric with respect to the marginals. Um, so if we combine this with the... Um, result I stated earlier. So remember that in Syncorn, in odd steps, the second marginal is correct. Uh, and in um, uh, even steps, the first marginal is correct. So if we combine with the results I explained later, it's not a result, it's just a fact that you can lower bound the Wasserstein between two couplings with the Wasserstein distance between the marginals. Uh, depending on whether the step is even or odd, we can always choose which um, um, marginal we want to, um, to keep fixed, and then we will get that um, the lower bound is also proportional to uh, n to the minus 1 over d. So essentially, the rate we're getting is sharp. The constant is absolutely terrible. If you see, it uh, depends exponentially in the soup norm of the, um, of the cost function. So essentially, it depends exponentially in the diameter of the space and uh, in the dimension as well. Um, uh, however, again, um, we were quite happy with the fact that the result is uniform in the iterations of Syncorn, because in practice, you'll never run the, the algorithm till convergence. You'll always stop at some finite number of steps, and you want to um, essentially know what's happening at that, uh, at that point. Obviously, if we have um, rates of good rates um, for the convergence of Syncorn, then we can get away with that. But um, uh, even that's not known in full generality. Um, in, in fact, however, um, the idea behind the proof of stability is very closely connected with um, the convergence of the algorithm. Um, and that's why we're limited essentially to compact uh, spaces, because that's where we know that the Syncorn iterates are essentially contractive. Okay, so uh, as a concept, uh, yes. like in the okay, also this bound. Like, is there a reason why you are using Wasserstein one instead of maybe like if you use like the Syncorn Syncorn divergence as the like the, the KL? I mean, instead of Wasserstein one, instead of you use like Syncorn divergence to measure like the distance between P n and P hat n. Yeah, I mean, that's like also it? possible. Um, so the reason I went, we went for that is because it was useful in the context of what we were doing um, uh, with respect to the, um, uh, to the differentiable particle filter. Uh, I mean, you can probably get away with other results as well. 
but um, because you want to iterate the particle filter over a number of iterations, at every step you're computing an expectation of a different um, of a different function. So um, at, at the moment, I thought that you know a, a, we thought that a uniform result would actually be uh, useful. I mean, KEL is also a possibility, but um, for our purposes, this was the um, essentially what seemed to be the most I useful see. formulation. Okay, I mean, I said this because like then the sample, uh, like the sample complexity might not depend on D, and then you might get some. Yeah, that, that's that that's that's true. Yes, that's true. Um, but. Essentially, this is uh, what, what we thought we needed at the time. You may be able to get away with different uh, things, uh, especially if you want to limit the number of iterations, you're going to run the particle filter. But anyways, um, okay, thank you. so but yes, that's that's another possibility. Uh, OK, so as a corollary, essentially, we get uh, the same result for the limiting um, uh, for the limit of the synchron, essentially for the Schrodinger bridge or for the solution of the entropy regularized um, optimal transport problem. Um, so uh, if you're wondering where the epsilon is, the strength of the regularization, it will be appearing as a denominator of the cost function because the, the, the cost is divided by epsilon. So that's where the epsilon and the dependence on epsilon will be. Um, so again, here we get the same, um, the same constant. Uh, and again, here the um, the marginals are given by pi zero and pi one, and the other marginals are given by pi hat zero and pi one. So again, in terms of sample complexity, the result is sharp if you want to measure things uniformly. Uh, okay, so um, the proof um, for the Schrodinger bridge is slightly simpler. Um, so I'll give the proof of the Schrodinger bridge actually. We first proved it for the Schrodinger bridge and then realized that uh, we can actually use it to, to prove it uniformly for, uh, for Sinkhorn. Um, but just for clarity, I'll give you the main steps in the proof for the Schrodinger bridge. Now, the main reason we are um, limiting ourselves to compact state spaces is because we can make use of the full machinery of essentially the Birkhoff-Hopf uh, contraction theorem. So uh, essentially, it's a theorem that tells you that any positive linear mapping um, is contractive if you measure um, if you measure distances in a projective way. So essentially, the metric used is called the Hilbert metric, the Hilbert projective metric, and it's a projective metric in the sense that it measures distances between rays. So if you want, um, essentially, we identify any function or any vector with uh, the, the vector times any positive constant. So we're looking at rays. Now, um, in the particular case where we're dealing with uh, function spaces, um, the Hilbert uh, projective metric essentially becomes the uh, oscillation of the function in the log scale. So Essentially, we're measuring the, how much the function oscillates. So like it's suprema minus it's infimum. We're looking at the ratio of the two functions. And then we're looking at the uh, oscillation of the ratio in the log scale. OK? Um, so then essentially the birkhoff hopf contraction theorem. So there's a lot of um, additional um, quantifiers. But essentially, it's, it's saying that if you have a positive linear mapping that sends a cone to a cone, so if you like positive functions to positive functions, then um, any such mapping will be contracting. And its uh, contraction constant is given by this hyperbolic tangent thing. Now, um, as soon as this constant, the projected diameter, this delta t constant is finite, so um, it's not infinite. Uh, this um, contraction constant will be strictly less than one. So we get a strict, um, a, a strong contraction. And in compact in compact spaces, uh, this does tend to be um, uh, finite. So we do get a strong contraction. And so if you like, one can use this to prove convergence of uh, Markov chains. Um, where essentially, in my mind, uh, in my intuition at least, uh, 
um, the fact that uh, we're using a projective metric is essentially uh, removing the eigenvalue um, at uh, one. So the um, it's removing um, the constant uh, functions or the constant vectors, if you like. Um, so uh, if you th if you think about what most convergence uh, results for Markov chains are telling you, it's like if you center the function. So if you if you if we look at the orthogonal complement of constant functions, um, then the Markov kernel is contracting under some uh, assumptions. Um, <clears throat> so in my mind, this um, essentially what the projective metric does for general linear maps is that it removes those constants and allows you to get a contraction uh, overall. So in our case, we're dealing with positive functions. Um, and we can decompose the iterates of Syncorn into essentially um, four maps. So each step of Syncorn can be is a composition of the following four maps. So we've got this curly E mu and curly E nu. Now these are um, very nice objects. These are usually sub Markov operators, and one can think of any way. They tend to be compact. They're very nice. So one could uh, prove contraction um, for the for these things uh, directly. The problem is that in the iterates, these mappings are being interlaced with the mapping that sends a positive function to its inverse. And as soon as you put that um, nonlinearity in the uh, iterates, any standard quantitative uh, contraction result you get using, let's say, contraction of uh, Markov operators or whatever, um, the contraction ratio will just uh, become terrible. So you're going to lose the contracting property once you uh, put it through the nonlinearity. And I'm talking about the standard ways of doing the analysis, not about the result. So the result may be true, but uh, it's not, you cannot use just standard um, results for convergence of Markov uh, operators uh, to prove this. So another magic feature of this Hilbert um, projective metric is that um, actually uh, this mapping that sends a function to its inverse is an isometry in the Hilbert projective metric. So this was um, pointed out, at least in my knowledge, um, by Chan, Gergiu, and Pavon. Um, and uh, essentially, if we're measuring things in the Hilbert metric, we just then have to analyze the linear maps I introduced uh, above. Um, it's easy to actually bound the projective diameter of these objects, at least in the compact state, in the compact space. So there's another place where compactness is important and very useful. Okay, so this is the promised um, um, expression of Syncorn as an interlacement of these maps. And um, so, as I said, when we're dealing with um, the Hilbert metric, then these curly eyes essentially are isometry, so we don't have to care about it. Uh, the remaining maps are strict contractions in the Hilbert metric. So essentially, we're going to be making use of this result to um, of, of these facts to put our proof together. So um, the other um, nice feature is that if we're dealing with the Schrodinger bridge, then we know that the potentials, um, I'm talking about the limit of the synchron algorithm, essentially, then the potentials will be fixed points of the corresponding synchron iterates. Okay, of these mappings, essentially. And this is useful um, for um, uh, reasons that I will explain at the end of this slide. Okay, so essentially we write down the, the exponential, if you like, of the potential. So we're looking at the potentials in the original scale rather than the log scale. Um, F epsilon is uh, the, the problem corresponding to the original, um, the, the potential corresponding to the original problem, and F hat is the problem, uh, the potential corresponding to whatever approximation you're using. And now the idea was to essentially look at expectation of some function, of some Lipschitz function H, and then um, split it in two parts. So the first part essentially looks at how the potentials differ. Uh, with the different marginals. And the second term essentially looks at how the marginals differ. Now, this part actually is um, has a much nicer interpretation um, in the dynamic case. So when you're looking at the iterates of Syncorn, because the first step actually corresponds 
to um, the forgetting of errors committed in past steps. So if you're thinking about filtering, this is essentially where you deal with the error being propagated from previous steps. And the second term is dealing with the local in time error you're committing in this step, in this time step. So um, the second term looks like it can be controlled by the Wasserstein distance. What we need is to be able to show that this object here, um, H, F hat, and K epsilon is Lipschitz. Actually, everything is actually fine except for potentially F hat. The problem with F hat is that these potentials are um, uh, in general only defined at the support of the measures. So if the measures are atomic, we only have um, these potentials um, at a bunch of uh, discrete points. Um, the, I mean, the, um, this is actually very well known, but you can extend these canonically to um, functions over the whole space. And the functions that you extend them to actually inherit any smoothness the cost has. So in our case, we assume that cost is Lipschitz. So these will be Lipschitz functions. Uh, if you want, one way to see how the extension works is um, because they're fixed points of the synchron map, we can actually um, view them as iterates of themselves. So we just iterate synchron on these potentials. We get essentially something that defines the exact same measures uh, with respect to the um, um, to the reference measures in each particular case. However, once we put the function through Syncorn, now it's defined everywhere because essentially the linear part of Syncorn is almost like a kernel density estimator. I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're, um, you're smoothing out the function or the measure that you started out with using uh, this kernel, e to the minus cost divided by epsilon. So essentially this function um, that we're dealing with appearing here is uh, is Lipschitz, so we can control the second term using Wasserstein. Now we're left with the first, uh, the first term where essentially we need to use the contraction. And there the idea is, again, it's a classical idea. If you've got something that is contracting and it's a fixed point of some, uh, of some map, then we can always use triangle inequality um, uh, by writing um, F epsilon and F hat epsilon as iterates of the corresponding synchron maps, then we can use the triangle inequality to first keep the synchron map the same and then keep the function the same. So the first term is essentially a smaller multiple of whatever appears on the left-hand side, and then the, right, the, the second term on the right can be controlled by Wasserstein. Okay, so we rearrange and we get this contraction. Obviously, if the contraction rate becomes one, the bound blows up, so we really need this to be a, str uh, a strong uh, contraction. Now, the final issue um, that we uh, had to deal with is the fact that uh, even after all these calculations, you've only managed to control, to control the, the potentials. Um, we've only managed to control the oscillations of the potentials, and to be able to prove um, essentially convergence in Wasserstein, you need, uh, so the obvious thing to use would be to use um, convergence in the supremum um, uh, metric. Uh, um, so obviously the oscillations is not a, doesn't give a metric because you can shift the functions up and down and uh, it's, uh, something that uh, has oscillation zero doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be zero. It can be, it's going to be constant, but it can be as large as you like. Uh, however, what um, essentially comes to the rescue is that, I mean, if you think of these objects, not in the logarithmic scale, but in the exponential scale, then they define the probability density function with respect to a reference measure. So essentially, it's a function that integrates to one. So it's a function that integrates to one and has bounded oscillation. We have control its oscillation. So essentially, if you like, you know, um, we're anchoring the function close to zero using the fact that it integrates to one, and then we're controlling um, how far it can deviate from zero using the oscillations. And then essentially we can go from um, the oscillations to the soup norm and uh, get the result. Um, so.
Now, when we're dealing with actually the iterates of Syncoin rather than just the limit, then there's a little bit more work that is required. Um, essentially, the, um, uh, you have to, the, the, the idea once you get, uh, once you understand how to prove for shorting a bridge, the idea is very similar to how you prove um, stability for uh, particle filters. Uh, you get like a similar type of decomposition, um, actually with very similar constants up front using some sort of geometric sum. But anyways, so um, that those are the main ideas in uh, our proof. Now, um, there has been a lot of progress, um, um, essentially, in the past year and a half. So actually, um, maybe one or uh, two months straight after uh, after our paper appeared, there was a very nice paper by Stefan Eckstein and uh, Marcel Nutz. They study non-compact spaces. They consider the Schrodinger bridge, so the limit of Syncorn, rather than the iterates of Syncorn, and they proved the uh, holder continuity, but the obviously the non-compactness is is uh, is a big deal. Uh, they've got moment uh, conditions uh, to control the tails of the measures, but yeah. Um, now in another pay in another recent paper by Rigol and Strom, um, they get dimension free rates. Uh, for various objects. So uh, I mentioned this earlier. If you forego trying to measure the distance between the couplings or measuring stability in some uniform metric, then this is in fact possible. Um, then there's uh, a few more papers. There's one by uh, Guillaume Carlier, Chiza, and Laborde, where they uh, essentially study the map that sends the marginals to the potentials, and they prove that. Uh, it's um, Lipschitz continues if we measure um, the the distance in this um, uh, Wasserstein uh, metric. It's almost like an L2 uh, Wasserstein 2 metric or norm. Um, there's another paper by Carini and uh, co-authors where they prove gradient estimates for uh, the potentials, and they get stability in terms of two terms. So this partially answers Umut's question as well. So they get um, one of the terms that measures stability is given in kullback leibler How, um, but uh, to the best of my understanding, there is an additional term which corresponds to some sort of uh, negative sobolev norm. Uh, and in some ways, um, these negative sobolev norms they appear. In, in, uh, when you're trying to write um, Wasserstein metrics other than Wasserstein 1, when you're trying to write it as an integral probability metric, uh, you often get expressions that involve these uh, negative order Sobolev norms. Essentially, you're testing um, expectations of a certain class of functions, and uh, you can think of that class of functions as defining essentially um, a negative Sobolev norm. And uh, more, even more recently, I think this was about a month or two ago, there were quantitative stability estimates for um, more general f-divergencies. Okay, so um, apologies if I've missed uh, anything. So I do uh, give a disclaimer that this is a very incomplete summary of state of play. Um, so uh, merci pour uh, votre attention. Uh, this is my best attempt at uh, something French. And here is, again, an incomplete list of references. I'm happy to share the, the slides so you can actually get hold of uh, the references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. So do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, you can just turn on your camera and ask if you want. Okay, while waiting, maybe I can ask one question. So I'm completely unfamiliar with the Hilbert metric, but then I see that like there is some sort of like projection, so it's based on projections, right? And uh, so it's projective in the sense of projective space because again we're identifying all positive multiples of a vector. So um, let me find the, the slide. Okay, so essentially X will be identified with this set. Mm -hmm. So if you like, in a way, we're measuring angles 
in a very vague way angles between elements in the space rather than okay i'm confused i mean i'm i'm still like a little bit uh, mm, how do you say i'm feeling the usage of like what's this time one might be losing you a lot of rate and constant so i'm just yeah it, it's it's the, it's very likely apology. it's very likely um so i mean i think you can pretty much do the same tricks and get versus any versus time distance mm -hmm. um uh but obviously if you don't care about doing it uniformly then yes you're gonna get different rates i see you're gonna get potentially dimension free rates okay uh, any other questions from the audience Okay, I so, I mean, I'm, if there's nothing, I can maybe um, uh, mention some questions I have. Okay. Have yeah. That, yeah. I, that, you know, I've been thinking about, but uh, at the moment, my main uh, research interest is, well, it's not a research interest, but I have a young son that takes up a lot of my time. So, but the, okay, the question is, can we get something like this? Like, I'm talking about a uniform result for the iterates. In, or in non-compact uh, settings. Um, now, the main the main sticking point is the fact that obviously this um, Hilbert metric will be infinite, uh, so you won't be able to use that, and there's no uh, Birkhoff contraction theorem to use. Um, so there's, I mean, uh, one potential idea is to use some sort of weighted um, Hilbert metric. Again, sticking to the Hilbert metric because it has this magical property of removing the nonlinearity. So one can think about using some sort of uh, weighted Hilbert metric, but then one has to essentially be able to provide contraction of Markov or sub Markov kernels in this metric, which is essentially, so you need a version of Birkhoff's contraction theorem um, for that case. Um, there, there is the possibility of, um, uh, taking like a more direct approach, similar to what Guillaume Carlier did with, um, with the multi-marginal problem. Um, there is the, um, there is, yeah, and I think that's pretty much, well, okay, the other thing is potentially we can truncate uh, the measures and then hope to, uh, um, hope that the essentially studying stability um, with respect to just truncation rather than more general perturbations of the measures is nicer. High probability results for that case, right? Like if you control the tails of the marginal. Yes, yes, uh, possibly. Yeah, mm -hmm. possibly you can give high probability results. But again, I think it will require some work because once you start putting these, you know, uh, you have to um, keep in mind what's happening. So if the measures are obviously, if you're talking about you know, if the empirical measures are obviously compactly supported, um, the problem is if the measure they're approximating is not compactly supported, how you can control the tails of that thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but what you what you're saying is is another possible route, but that would require coupling the synchron as a stochastic process. So. I think you know it's. I think it's possible to do it using these diffusion Schrödinger bridges, like these. Um, um, essentially, it's like a, a sort of a generative model, um, uh, a very popular generative. Um, so diffusion models are now very popular generative models. The diffusion Schrödinger bridge is a particular flavor of that, and it does actually generate a coupling um, between, it, it, like um, a stochastic version of synchron. So it does allow you to essentially generate samples from the iterates of synchron. So potentially you can couple them and get high probability results. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay, one last question that I have. Yes. Um, so as far as I know, the, this, uh, like the synchron algorithm is close ties with matrix factorization, right? So like yes. you want to decompose it into factors. 
So can we use like these results to say something about like the stability of matrix factorization algorithms as well? Because I um, like that. Yeah, I mean, if you can write, if you can write uh, matrix factorization as um, some some sort of like you know synchron uh, applied to um, uh, to to a problem of this of this form, then yes. So I'm not exactly um, sure about um, matrix factorization, but like the iterative proportional fitting procedure is is coming from um, contingency tables, essentially uh, where you fixing the marginals uh, successively, and then you end up with um, yeah. So it, it it may be actually very uh, very closely related. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Any last chance to ask a question from the audience? All right, so if there is no more questions, so let's finish the session again. So let's congratulate the speaker. Thanks again. And Thank you. I will stop the recording now.